ready for the next lecture. So, uh, right now we have with us uh, Vuk Markovic, a software engineer at uh, EPAM System. Uh, Vuk is a, a senior software engineer with uh, lots of years of experience of building different types uh, of applications, dealing with distributed systems and building scalable applications that can support thousands of users. Um, and today he's going to talk about uh, how, how to architecture uh, real-time cloud collaboration systems, uh, definitely an emerging need uh, to have an effective communication in real time causes a lot of, of course, technical challenges um, for us as developers to overcome. Uh, so uh, it's a really interesting topic that I personally have also like uh, been dealing with a little bit in the past and I know how challenging that can be. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but uh, essentially like all there's like applications that have thousands of um, uh, simultaneous users which are using the same functionality and like you have to support all of them being able to work and to communicate with each, with each other again without overloading your infrastructure and resources you have at disposal so like optimizing for all of this can be a daunting and challenging task so uh, I'm really looking forward to see how uh, EPAM and Vuk have uh, what what you have prepared for us today so thank you well, where is the root of everything? Specifically, difficult times, especially ones during COVID-19 have given us some kind of opportunity to grow, develop, learn and leverage cloud collaboration systems. And those tools became an integral part of our everyday work life. Tools such as Google Documents, Microsoft Office 365, live whiteboards, project management tools, they're all there. And how many of you have used at least once one of those tools? Great, amazing. And have you ever wondered what does it take for someone to architect such a platform? Are there any tips and tricks? Are there any strategies before going in such direction? My name is Vuk. I'm a software engineer at IPAM Systems. And I'll be more than glad to introduce you to the topic of architecting real-time cloud collaboration systems. And before we begin, we actually need to understand the act of leveraging application state capabilities, especially in multi-user environments where the act, the event of state mutation, is important to achieve overall consistency. And after all, we will discuss some important components that every cloud collaboration system should really have. And as every system, it needs really a way for its components to communicate, right? And therefore, we'll explore some protocols of communication that you can probably leverage in your projects. So we may begin with the first topic, because leveraging the application state capabilities really means building the logical foundation for your, for your cloud application system. And you may ask ourselves, well, what is really an application state? And I'm now interested uh, have, how many of you have ever worked with React Framework? Raise your hands if you did. Glad to see that. I love React too. So basically, specifically, uh, application state would represent a value or a set of values that are somehow coupled to the application instance or specifically to a single session of ap an application's instance. And Usually, when we work with React, we would specifically see that behavior through components that have some kind of values tightly coupled to them, are giving us some kind of logic, some kind of interface through which we can change it, therefore actually re-rendering the whole component. And when we actually take a look at one example, on the left side, we have some JSON. So this specific example is uh, why one of my mockups for a project management tool. And on the left side, we have a JSON that is freshly fetched from an API. So it contains some descriptions, some titles, and through some presentational logic right here, so some rendering logic happens, we would be, or specifically our users, would specifically be able to see that through some very nice looking UI, right? And also giving us 
an interface through which we can perform some changes. For example, check and uncheck the box, or maybe even change the title, right? Change the description or anything specific. And that very act, the act when we perform some action, some event that produces the change in the application state, even in one field of it, it we would call it a state mutation. And imagine this situation. Imagine that, for example, you and you, for example, had two equivalent devices with equivalent versions of the application. So the same application under same conditions. And we decided to, or maybe even I, decided to have a list of actions, list of events. So let it be five events in some random events that I would, in the same order, perform on one and on the other device. If we achieve the fact that in the end we would have an equal state on both of those devices, in equal state of the application, we would actually achieve one step towards state synchronization, which was really our goal towards building such a system. Obviously, this brings us to the initial point of multi-user environment, because if we want to have something delivered to those users, we would have to first have it somewhere. This would be the first step, the first logical step that would come to our mind, right? And if we had a single user environment, we would have our presentation logic right here, right? And it would, con it would be based on some kind of state, so some kind of list of values, list of objects, something like that, that will be rendered out as this single task that you will be able to change. And when you perform some changes, obviously this state will change. And if we would want those changes to persist somehow, we would actually do the following. We would save the task, and that task right here should be delivered to our API, which will be our source of truth. The source will such state, such information would be persisted. And if we take a look at a more complex architecture containing multiple instances, so let's see. Here we have uh, our presentation, right? And it has its own state. And this state, and this state, and this state, and this state are local. They are not synchronized. So if you perform some change on one of the presentations, Unless you synchronize it with the API, such that it bro broadcasts the information to other ones, we cannot actually do anything in terms of the synchronization. So the overall goal is to make an architecture, so that is our second step, to make an architecture that will, through some kind of communication protocol, so we will have the discussion about communication protocols later, through some kind of communication protocol, we have to like deliver that information to the API, right? And API will be like the radio station. And the radio station will perform an action of broadcasting the state to all other instances, right? Therefore, we need to actually later on think about what communication protocol can we use to really achieve that bidirectional communication. And you may even know it, but we'll get to that very soon. And of course, this um, multi-user environment approach comes with its own with its own issues or problems that we may actually encounter. So let's suppose that we have four application instances right here. So all of them are separate and all of them have their own state. And that state is based on our previous example, which is the task, the project management tool. And let's imagine that all four users wanted to change one specific task. So let's imagine that the first one wanted actually to perform a green change. So the green change says, okay, I marked the third checkbox item as done, all right? The red one says, oh, I've updated the task title. All right, fine. The yellow one said, I marked the second checkbox item as done. I mean, I'm fine with that. And the fourth one said, oh, let's uh, update the task description. And ideally, when looked through that point of view, it would be ideal if it was all that easy. But when we introduce our point of our source of truth, which will be the API, this data will somehow have to travel to it. And you may ask why? Well, simply because API will need to dispatch that information to other instances. So that information will need to travel somehow. 
And that act of traveling, if we take a look at a very small time span, can be at different speed, right? And let's imagine this specific scenario. The red update, which was updating the task title, right, started traveling from the presentation, from the actual application, to the API. And at the, at it contains, since we're sending out at the moment, we're sending out whole task to be saved, the API will simply take it and say, okay, I will persist that. I mean, you wanted me to save this, I will do that. This is how you developed me. But later on, the API will also have to distribute that change to other devices. But before this red one came to the API and before it was broadcasted to other instances, the yellow one started traveling, the green one did also, and the purple one also did. And they do not know about the change that was created. So what kind of conflict does it bring? Well, if we look at this uh, timetable, think, seeing, for example, the first task state one, the red one that came in, will just simply update the task title to the new title. All other fields, are the old ones. So the checkbox item two is in progress, checkbox item three still in progress, task description is still the old description, which was, I mean, it, the, our API really did the job that we expected it. And the yellow state then came in and decided to screw everything. And how did that happen? Well, obviously, because we forgot that it contains actually the old title. And when the API decided to persist the yellow state, it basically overlapped the previous one. Therefore, we have the checkbox item to change. Here it is. But the old title is there, and this is not what we initially wanted to, right? And when the green one came in, it has the old title. It has the old in progress. Where is the change? Oh, only this one. But where are the other changes? So they've also been overlapped by the green one. And in the end, the purple state decided to like destroy everything and just keep the new description. So imagine that situation where multiple users are editing one same task and all of them make the change at very small time gap. And in the end, the only change that is actually visible is the fourth one. And that creates a massive inconsistency because not only that each presentation layer, each instance may have a wrong state, but also the source of truth that should actually deliver the last state, the purple state technically from the previous example, also has the wrong value because where are the other, the other three changes, right? And that really is a problem. Therefore, we need to improve our state mutation strategy. Now, among you React developers, how many of you have ever encountered class components? Raise your hands if you did. Okay, nice to see that. I practically loved them at the time when they were present. And specifically because it is much, um, let's say, transparent, much more transparent to see what is going on with the state itself. Because we will use it approach. So in case you are not familiar with React class components, the way the state is managed in simple words would be, we have a class component, right? And it has a field called state. And we have some kind of, let's say, a method through which we can pass on the new, the, new, the new values for the state, right? And since the state object, so it is an object, will have multiple fields in it, if we want to perform a change on some of the fields, we won't actually give it the whole state, but only the things that have been changed. And, that is our idea. Instead of sending the whole task information from the, from the instances, from the applications, we will only send task deltas. And what is a task delta? It is an object containing a field, or maybe even a list of fields if you want, of what has changed. So the green delta says, hey, title has changed. All right, I'm fine with that. The red one says, for example, task two has been marked as done. The yellow one says ta task three has been marked as done. And the purple one says, hey, I'm a new description, right? Please, please take it. And we would need to like have some kind of an engine, some kind of logic that would merge it somehow, right? 
So it needs to zip it into a single persisted state that it would save on the somewhere. We will see where a little bit later. And if we take a look at the timeline, it has much more sense now since when the first change is being performed, it actually persists the change that has been made. But when the second one comes, so the task delta 2, the new title is now here because it did not care what was there. The yellow state actually did not contain the definitions for title and other fields except the, the field that it has to change, which is really the task item number two, right? And, well, obviously, if there was something else here in the new title, it will be also present in here. Therefore, we actually managed to perform that act of merging things. Obviously, the third one will also have new title, task item two being marked as done, and the task item three marked as done. And when the fourth task delta comes in, we would have a task description set to be the new description, and all other fields are there and persisted. Therefore, we've actually achieved a massive step. Now we have a correct, correct state, right? Well, not really, because there are many problems that may come with it, such as a few different ways to manage the state itself that is basically elevated to the remote machine. We can perform something called, at least I would call it like that, explicit mutation. It would be like if you, for example, decided to remember the status of the task and one day I would tell you, hey, please mark this as done. I would literally tell you, okay, this is now done. But what if, for example, you held a paper and you would like put lines on it, counting something. And I wouldn't tell you really, hey, please now put one line, please put two lines and so on and so on. I would tell you, add a new line. So it's a much more event-based approach rather than explicit approach, which means that in this specific case, we have a counter. We have a counter set to zero and we will perform an increment action right here. And our counter will become one. Great. And after we, after we perform the second increment action, the counter will become two. Well, you may ask, but why are we, I mean, what is so wrong with the explicit mutation? Let's take a look at this specific example. Let's say that, let's imagine that those two instances that we now see here decide to have a counter set to zero, which would be an equivalent, an equivalent of, for example, two of you, if you had a device, or many, many of you, had a device with a big red button and number zero in there. And you made this, so it will be an equivalent of having this counter set, set to zero. All right, fine. But what happens when we click the button? Well, our application's logic would ideally say, okay, this is zero, let's increase it by one. This now becomes counter one. And the application is happy because it will send that state to the, to the API. Great. But the second application decides to ruin everything, or maybe it's the opposite, by setting the state also to one, because at the moment when the counter has been pressed to increase, the other, so this instance, did not get all the information that this one has been increased. So it also happens at a very small time span. But we are realistically building real-time cloud collaboration applications, not five-year collaboration applications. And our goal is to make sure that in the end, the API, when it takes those two states, it will actually persist number one. But the counter has been pressed twice and we are expecting really to have number two in there. But what if we use our logic from before. So our application instances, instead of sending out explicit state values, it will realistically send an event, hey, please increment that. And there can be some kind of queue indeed, but in this example, if we had some counter now being persisted in the API, we can actually, when we accept those events somehow, so the event would be the increment event, we would specifically increase this counter 
So it will become one, right? And the second one also will come. So it really doesn't matter even in this case, it doesn't matter in which way they come. If they do, there can be some kind of Q, right? But in this case, it doesn't matter, so they can be performed at in any order, right? And the, the goal that should be in there is the counter being set to two. And really, it works like that. That's actually great. But that would also imply that we would need to implement some kind of event handler and some kind of state mutator in here. Now you'll ask, what is this term? What is state mutator? Well, we'll actually take a look at that very, very soon. Because we need to approach a problem which is actually being resolved with that, with that state mutator. And that problem are solved by something called operational transformations. Specifically, that can be uh, applied in situations where multiple people are working in a document. So imagine, for example, Google Docs. And you know the situation where you can have as many cursors of many people as you'd like, and many of them are writing at the same time. So you would ideally want all of them to have a good experience, right? We do not want uh, anyone to be uh, disconnected for some reason or to lose the cursor or to like, don't, like, we don't want any mess in there. And there are two examples of how operational transformation as a strategy for resolving such conflicts will help us to like, resolve those conflicts. And example one will be what happens in case of concurrent deletion and insertion. So we have Alice and Bob. Yesterday, Alice started learning about C and C++ and I can tell you she's not happy with it. And she decided whenever she sees letter C in a document, she just wants to remove it from the existence. And yeah, she wants to do that. Well, Bob says, hey, uh, I want to insert a letter. He's a pretty basic guy. And Alice is on my side and wants to delete C. Fine. And here is the problem. Bob ideally wanted to put uh, to put X right on the left side of D, which would be technically uh, position three at the line one of this document. So imagine that this is really a document. And Alice wanted to remove letter C, which is at position two. But if Alice finally removes C, which I'm happy to see, get it? Uh, Bob will actually have now a conflict because Letter E is now at the place three. And when we have an event that is dispatched from Bob's instance to the server, it would, it would say, okay, there, uh, an insertion happened at line one, position three. Because Bob wanted to do that. Bob wanted to put it on the left side of D. He doesn't know about lines and all that stuff. And what happened if we didn't uh, like apply those transformations? Well. Specifically, his letter X would be on the left side of E instead of D. Therefore, we need to have some kind of operations to move his cursor to the left. So he won't actually even notice it. Because let's imagine that you are writing a paragraph with someone in Google Documents and you have, you are like on the end of the paragraph writing a word and someone else decides to be a savage and remove things from the document. And as they're doing that, you really want to stay at the same place of the context of the world where you're at. So our goal is that when things are being removed and we want to enter some things, to input something, our cursor will stay right where it should be. And therefore, Bob's letter will be placed right where it should be, which was, which was ideally our goal and operational transformations are an incredibly good strategy for achieving such things because if you want to develop cloud collaboration applications that are basically based on some resource containing some text or even objects of some sort, let it be anything, you really need to consider those if you want really to like avoid conflicts. And what if one day Alice and Bob decided to resolve uh, their conflicts one day 
C is back, we won't tell Alice about that. And what if both of them wanted to insert a character at position three? Well, here is the problem. Alice will create an event, basically. So the event says, okay, here is a new, there, there will be a new character Y at position, at position three, right? And Bob's event also says, well, there will be a new character at position three. And ideally, we would want to have some order. So uh, we would use a strategy of first come, first serve. So the first event that comes will be ideally served and letter Y will come into place and Bob's cursor, Bob's input event, will be moved one place to the right because maybe Bob really wanted to put it on the left side of the... No, it's like a matter of concerns because maybe Alice wanted to do it too, right? But it's about resolving the conflict such that the user experience in the end remains as, as it should. And obviously the letter X will come in here, which was our goal. And if we take a look at all that logic that happens, it really needs to happen somewhere. We need to think of an architecture or at least an order of components in which we'll, we'll, so those will be some kind of blueprint for our system. And how will that look like? Well, we would have some kind of API, right? It's easy. And we will have an event handler. Now, if you're familiar with tiered, layered infrastructure or something that would be an equivalent of a domain-driven design or anything else, you're familiar with the concept of controllers. So this would be a very simple version of a controller, which goal is to accept events. So if an event happens, it will come to an API and the event handler will later on basically pass the concern to other service or an object or microservice that should perform some job. And We've mentioned this one before, which was the state mutator. This is something that would be, so after the event handler, we would have the state mutator and this specific engine, it's just an abstraction that you can also put in a microservice or you can put it to be as the part of the monolithic application. And its job is to validate things. So if we want to perform some change, this guy will actually do the job. We want to somehow validate if the change can be really made to perform those operational transformations such that when the state itself needs to be saved into the database of some sort or into any source, well, we need to really do it the right way. So it will be like some kind of business logic stored in here. The other one being the state dispatcher, which is our output engine. So typically a reverse of our event handler. What it does is specifically just broadcast what happened to all other devices, as simple as that. So an event happens, a state changes. Okay, I want my state dispatcher to just bring the change to everyone. And the fourth component, which is technically, we can say important in a centralized infrastructure of this approach, it will be like, okay, let's have an infrastructural uh, database layer of some sort where we can actually store or persist the state such that it can be accessed by our application and other instances. Well, indeed, that would be a good choice and we would implement this state persister as an abstraction, as a layer that has simple actions that can be performed in a database, such as field saving, uh, field al altering, and so on and so on. So you may choose a document-based database or anything that you'd really like. It's up, to your, it's up to your choice. And when we bring all those components together, so as you can see, not only the API will have this logic, but also in a similar way, our instances, so this is one instance, of the application, so this is a client application. This is the second, the third, and the fourth. All of them, besides their presentation and state, also have their own event handler because obviously we need to communicate with the API and we are not the, the API is not the only source that listens to events. It's not the only one. We also listen for events. Why? Because those events need to be broadcasted from the API. So the API needs to deliver the information deliver those deltas to our event handler. 
So our state mutator, which may come with the specific library that you're using, you may develop it on your own, it's up to your choice, will actually alter the state based on some logic. And that logic should be the same on all instances. And in the end, we will achieve the infrastructure and the architecture we really need in order, in order to build a cloud collaboration application. And the, the other approach would be having a dispatcher of some sort. Now you may ask, where is the API? Well, it is technically there. So we have um, a center, but it is not the source of truth anymore. So in our previous example, right, this one, if one of the user disconnects, it commonly happens, all of us disconnect sometimes, our goal is for this instance to have a source from which it will restore its session. So ses restoring the session is ideally something that we've seen in many, many applications, right? And what if all users disconnected from the session? Well, they, the state is here. So when they reconnect, at least one of them, the session will be realistically restored. But in this specific example, dispatcher is not storing anything. The persistor is not there. And that would specifically mean that its only job is to be a mask of communication. So mask of communication that will just let the presentation layer, or specifically the application and everything else, have some kind of interface through which some action can be dispatched to all other instances. So when the presentation wants to deliver something, it will deliver, deliver the delta, the change, to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher's job will be to dispatch the change to all other clients. And since there are many people that like decentralized infrastructure, we, and we would also have a solution for this, some kind of solution that will be probably peer-to-peer -peer based. If, of course, our network allows that, our firewalls and everything else, probably something good for private infrastructure or something like that, where we have trusted clients, trusted devices, and so on, where event handlers will technically communicate between each other with those task deltas. So when one presentation layer, the, the application performs some change, its task delta will be delivered to all other instances in the network. And there is no source of truth. So uh, in case all four users disconnect, we do not have this state persisted anywhere and we would simply lose that. But of course, there are many good usages to that, and you may think of it based on your requirements and specification. And as you may see, there's a lot of communication in there, right? Not only between those components, but also between the inner components inside the system and also inside the API itself. And we need to think, since it's a system, what protocols of communication we can really use in here, right? And it'll be like comparing apples to oranges. Why? Because each communication protocol has its own usage, has its own like charm to it. And HTTP requests, which will be our first one, will be a traditional communication between a client and the server. Now, we cannot have a, since it's a client server based approach, we cannot have a, like a response without a request. So if, for example, you've asked me a question, I can give you a response, but I cannot give you a response without a request, therefore. And since we have a lot of bidirectional communication in our system, we need somehow to make clients be able to listen for responses, to listen for some kind of events. And the solution are really WebSockets. So WebSockets will provide us an event-driven bidirectional communication that we can leverage in order to build our cloud collaboration system, right? And in the end, we have gRPC, since we may actually even approach the idea of microservice architecture, especially with those components that we can pretty much decouple if you want it to, them to be. And it's a much modern approach where you can have protobuf, protocol buffers, and like send the data between microservices in both phases and have a pretty nice infrastructure in terms of the API, such that you can slice it into pieces and have the components communicate in a very fast and nice way, just like as it was a monolith. And by the way, also achieving the microservice architecture. But our goal, our specific focus are WebSockets. Again, why WebSockets? Because they're establishing a long-lived connection. 
that is also bidirectional, and it supports a way for us to send some data through it. And how is that connection being made? Well, it is being made through something called a handshake. Now, a handshake, specifically, is an action that happens between two instances. So, two instances, one day, so there was an instance one, and it was a really nice friend with the instance two. They decided first to be an HTTP friends, and one day, one of them said, hey, can we please be something more than that? Can we become web sockets? Therefore, upgrading our connection, also providing some keys, probably even authentication of some sort. And, of course, if the response is right, if the request is looking well and all that, the response will really answer with an upgrade. And therefore, we would have some kind of handshake. Therefore, we would upgrade our connection to be long established and long lived. Obviously, since we are able to send our data between instances, we also need a way of some sort to uh, structureize our data because we have, for example, inst uh, increments uh, of state. Or if you remember the example from before, we are actually orienting our uh, state mutations to be around events, and we need a way for those events to be really to be really propagated, right? And that means that we need to structureize the data, the data that we are sending, to have some field of some sort uh, resembling what the event is. And if we look at a pretty simple example, the one that you maybe even be given, for example, in Node.js you have um, Socket.io, which provides a similar thing. This is just a real code, pseudo code variant of it, showing, okay, we have some, um, like, way to attach a label, a label, or specifically a callback to a label. And if we receive some data, we will perform some callbacks, since there is a lot of boilerplate code on the, on the top and the bottom. But our goal is when the event is received, we ideally want to read what that, after parsing and all that, we really want to know what ideally the event was and to like perform that action. And the user of that client server would be able to like, you know, create those events such as increment, decrement, set value, and attach the callbacks to it. So it's a very similar environment where we can actually define what happens if such event happens. And one example for that from before the task updates, where we are actually showing here the explicit state mutation. So if task update happens, we have some kind of event, we are reading the task that we've sent through our payload, and our state mutator service, which performs operational transformations and all that, is actually reading, okay, what environment it is, what object it is, and what should I save? And when the change is done, obviously we can add some additional validation in there and all that, but not to annoy you, in the end we would broadcast the change to all other clients connected in the environment itself, which was ideally our goal. But since we've learned that explicit mutation is not really that good, we want to like updates to make updates based on the fields that actually change. So this is some kind of pseudo real code for it, where we would actually receive the updates that are you know, fr from the event. And for each entry, we would ask our state mutator service to update that field. In the end, we would get the persistent instance, or actually the changes that, that, ha that have been made. Persistent instance will give us the, the changes, and we will distribute the change to other clients as well. And I've also mentioned that there is a more serverless, or specifically this is serverful, but more, a version that doesn't contain any kind of persistent instance with the dispatcher approach. And here is how it looks like. It's pretty minimal. So we fetch the updates, and we will broadcast the updates to other clients. Because remember, all other clients have their own state mutators in it that will perform operational transformations on their own. So it's like you're trusting that the implementation of the client will match the expectations su such that the state will really be mutated in the right way. And uh, obviously, uh, this will wrap up our overall idea that we can really have a various ways of implementing such mutations and such event handling uh, capabilities in our uh, system, and therefore building a cloud collaboration system. And if we actually 
had to wrap up the cables and get the overall idea of what have we actually learned and what have we actually applied. Well, we've actually uh, realized that states are incredibly important for us. Right? We've actually learned that we can use um, events of some sort and basically orient our state mutations to be uh, with, the, with the events. So when an event happens, we need like to stick what has been changed in it, like some payload, but also be as uh, less explicit as possible such that we do not have uh, the problem with the explicit mutations such as before. And we would have operational transformations, which would specifically be our way to resolve conflicts. If you remember Alice at Bob, Alice did not get her justice with letter C being not removed. And web sockets, obviously, since again, our system needs a way for its components to communicate. And the main core idea will, would be those web sockets which would provide us a protocol of bidirectional real time communication. And also, it will provide us a way to have some headers of some sort that we can use for authentication. And while we are at the auth authentication, please do not forget since we need to have a good uh, real-time user experience. And if we do not have some way of refreshing the session in case some time expires, we actually may have a lot of problems. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Feel free to go. Can you? Can someone get the microphone? Yep. Or I can be loud. Well, I, I mean, I can hear you, but I guess for the others, right? <laughs> so when we are having uh, multiple simul simultaneous uh, changes to the state, sending it from the client, and uh, in each of those mutation requests, there is the same field changed. Then we will have only one left at the end, the latest that arrived. So all the uh, intermediate changes will be lost. And uh, is there any way or any idea how should we maybe handle that and signal the uh, senders that their change was discarded? Thank you. Yeah, that's a pretty good question. So specifically, we can have a several approaches to it. We can have a queue-based approach, so basically store the events in a, in a queue such that we will know which one comes first, or we could make it be, okay, first come, first served, which would basically mean that, all right, whatever the first one comes first, because if we have two clients, they have equal amount of, let's say, opportunity to change some field, right? And we should not like uh, let the other one have less priority than the other. That means that we will just let it go uh, by whatever one comes first. But if there is some kind of priority needed, some kind of logic, we would probably mention it in the payload of the event to mention in some way that the event really requires some kind of priority. And that means that the events that come with it may not go directly to the state, but enter some kind of queue. So instead of just letting it through, we would let those events go to the queue. So those priority ones would come first and then the ones that have less priority. Other than that, I'm not sure what would really be a much better approach uh, than that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, so the situation that you described when you have different uh, clients working with the same data and mutating it uh, is occurred not only in distributed systems. Sometimes you get it just in normal multi-threading when you are developing one local application, even let it be desktop app or IoT app, and it is usually called race conditions. So in operating systems, uh, you have, in lots of operating systems, one of most introduced feature is multitasking, and for multitasking, they introduce lots of useful features. So one of basic features for multitasking is uh, semaphores and critical sections. My question is, uh, is there any similar approach to semaphores in distributed systems? Exactly, Mu uh, we, we could use mutexes, 
guards of some sort that act pretty much very similar to the semaphore mechanism you, you mentioned. So we could like guard the actual state to be changed. Well, the change is happening. We would mark the mutex such that other change cannot come to it, therefore avoiding the race condition you mentioned, which should happen in multi-threaded applications. And it is a part of many many tools, even in databases, you have some kind of mutexes that you can use. If you are developing applications in C, Java, and other applications, you also have some kind of mutexes added in the standard library that you could like implement in the whole infrastructure such that you can guard the very moment of performing the operation. So then you've mentioned the very act of um, operating systems and our goal, right, is to make sure that we perform atomic operations. Right? So our goal is to make sure to atomicize the very act of changing the state, which, would, which can be really done through mutexes, or maybe there is even other implementation of that that could be done. But that is the first one that would come to my mind. Uh, I also want to ask the following question. Uh, we have uh, exactly the problem with distributed system, as you mentioned, is a connect channel. So uh, when you have uh, some long distance between machines, uh, even let it be one room, you have different time for travel for the packet from different machines. So how do you create uh, critical sections on mutexes? Because they also need time to say, like for when one client wants to create big mutation, of course we can send like small packet like packet like start mutex, but we, uh, we still encounter race, race conditions. Uh, well, ideally, yes. So, in case the clients themselves are distant from the from the source of truth, which would be technically, the, in at some point in the world, our goal is to actually. So, if both of those requests travel at so at different speeds, right, they would require a different amount of time to come to the to, to the instance, and of course, there is a race condition in that. But the actual change that happens is on the API itself and if we had some kind of queue in there or some kind i mean the, what is obvious is that one of them will come first so it may be by a millisecond difference or more than, than that and obviously when the first one comes in um, it would just lock up the whole uh, system in not the whole system but the whole act the event of incrementing for example a counter right and therefore the other one However long that uh, it traveled, it can be hours. If the state mutation um, system, the state mutation machine is still locked, therefore we cannot, the, the very event of, that has to come to the instance of change wouldn't really come to it because the queue will hold it. And uh, probably we could even implement some kind of fallback mechanism because queues, for example, first thing that comes to mind is AWS SQS. We should be able to like, uh, if we had some way to, de to detect that uh, change is very distant or f that it could create a problem to us, we can maybe create a back, uh, backup mechanism, not really a backup mechanism, but like put it, uh, put it again in the queue such that it can be performed again uh, and override the state if it really needed to. But other than that, I think that still uh, the way of locking uh, the operation inside the state mutation service would still do it right. Maybe we would not make the state mutation service itself be distributed. We, we would make the state mutation service stay monolith. But um, I don't see the other way in which we should really like avoid that problem that is like even inevitable in some way. Thank you, too. Thank you, Book. Uh, I also have a question. We have one more question, but we unfortunately don't have the time to answer anymore as we uh, have a tight schedule. I'd like to add, if, of course, you can ask me on my LinkedIn. I'll be happy to answer you. Yeah. So also approach later on. We, we do have a break now, so yep. we can keep uh, talking on the break. Thank you, Book. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.